I'm going to hand it over now today um, to Davis McKenzie. So from Davis is the Communications Director with the First Nations Health Authority, and we're delighted to have him start us off today. Go ahead, Davis. Hi, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, I'm sharing the screen here with the lovely uh, Gerby Pierre, who's going to open us up in the right way. Uh, just a couple of notes before we proceed. Um, really, due to the, some of the sensitive subject matter, uh, we wanted to um, just ensure that everybody's taking care of themselves um, related to these types of conversations. So um, we've listed a toll-free crisis line. Um, should any of the content on here um, make you need to reach out uh, to a mentor, family, friend? So um, we encourage, as we go into this 12-part series, um, please ensure you've got the, the correct support networks around you uh, to help you. So um, our friends at IRSS are also uh, always uh, ready and available to help us. Um, so next slide, please. I can do that. Sorry, technical difficulties. There we go. Um, uh, just a, a brief note that this session will be recorded, so if you choose to remain anonymous, please type a non uh, before your question and will be read out as such. Uh, thank you for that. And finally, um, we're, we're really happy today uh, to have uh, Gertrude uh, Pierre joining us. Uh, who goes by Gertie. Our, uh, Gertie is a Seashelt uh, Nation elder and residential school survivor. Um, attending residential school for 10 years has not held Gertie back. Uh, after years of healing, she graduated with a Bachelor of Social Work in 2011 um, and at age 65. Um, uh, Gertie has worked uh, with the Aboriginal Front Door Society and Vancouver Aboriginal Community Policing Center, uh, helping people in the downtown East High and is currently working with the Indian Residential School Survivor Society supporting survivors in their healing journey. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Gertie. Thanks for joining us. Gertie said, like to thank the grandfathers and grandmothers, and um, especially um, Squamish Band, the Burrard, and the Musqueam people for the land, unceded land that we are on. Um, Thank you, Creator, for everything that we have on this day. Bless us and keep us healthy and strong and protect us and all our people that are struggling and suffering without food, without a home, and are struggling through their lives. I pray for today that they're having a murdered and missing woman gathering down Victory Square, and I pray for all the people that will be there in trying to get their missing people that are missing found and pray for the strength that they need for those that have lost um, people to murder. Thank you, Creator, for the strength that you, you give us every day. I am very happy to be here today and helping others with whatever is to be almost child. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gertie, for opening us up in, in the right way. Um, we're, we're now going to welcome our, our uh, keynote event, uh, Joe Gallagher. Uh, Joe's ancestral name is Punimun. Uh, he's a Coast Salish mom in First Nation ancestry and serves as Chief Executive Officer of the First Nations Health Authority. Over the past decade, Mr. Gallagher was lead in the formation of a new health governance partnership between BC First Nations, the province of BC, and the Government of Canada, which included the negotiation of the successful transfer of federal health services to BC First Nations control. Uh, this work, a first for Canada, led to the formation of the First Nations Health Authority, a wellness organization driven by First Nations holistic and traditional perspectives on health and wellness. A senior leader in health with uh, 10 years experience, Joe, Joe brings 25 years experience in community development, intergovernmental affairs, and negotiation. Throughout his career, Joe has worked with all levels of government, First Nations, community, and organizations in both urban and rural settings. Uh, we'll now turn it over to our CEO, Joe Gallagher. Good afternoon, and uh, really happy to be here today. I um, first of all want to thank uh, Gertie for her, her prayer and her words. Always important to start the work in the right way. 
Also acknowledging Squamish, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh territory. Great to be here on their land today, and webcasting across um, British Columbia and across North America. Um, this, today we have a. I'm honored to have the opportunity to launch this series and to talk about the work that we're doing at the First Nations Health Authority. And, and I think it's really important as we think about the work in British Columbia that is really, I think, quite um, um, leading edge, if you will, in relation to where we are in this country, in Canada. And in, in our recent discussions with the federal government and talking about the importance of, of reconciliation, the importance of the UN Declaration of Indigenous Rights, um, that the First Nations Health Partnership in British Columbia is an exciting opportunity to see First Nations self-determination in action. And so what I wanted to talk a bit about today is our work that we're doing in the area of cultural safety and humility. And what's really important for us is to recognize that um, the work that we're doing in British Columbia really comes from a new health partnership that we've created with the province of British Columbia and the Government of Canada that started in about 2006. And in 2007 to 2011, we basically built a new health partnership um, between the, the provincial and federal government and First Nations. But what's really important to that is that uh, with British Columbia having 203 First Nations ourselves, we actually created a partnership among ourselves as First Nations communities to work together in health under one umbrella. And it was a very, in my mind, an unprecedented decision of self-determination made by First Nations leaders coming together at a ritual forum and moving this work forward in a good way. And, and a big part of that work is that um, First Nations were very clear that what we're doing were, was creating First Nations institutions. We're designing First Nations institutions by First Nations people for First Nations people. That was really important because I think that um, the history that we've had in this country since colonization, we've really struggled with the notion of um, someone else's institutions doing things to us without us. Uh, colonization was a very direct and attempt around uh, assimilation and ensuring that First Nations people basically fit into the ideology of the mainstream population, the, the colonizers of the day. And so the work that we do really is, is driven from a First Nation set of values and teachings. And what you see on the screen is, is um, our First Nations perspective, health and wellness. So as we're building our health partnership and our governance structures with BC and Canada, we've talked to our First Nations communities and what we've done is, is brought forward the culmination of, of, of those conversations which represents um, a body of knowledge that um, our people have been living by for thousands of years and this First Nations perspective, health and wellness is the lens in which we do all of our work. Everything we do at the FNHA begins and ends with this perspective, health and wellness, and it really is a way of framing and grounding our conversation that we have on health and wellness with our First Nations communities. Some of the pieces in it that I think are really important is that you'll note that it has the human being in the center. And that's really important because our goal at the First Nations Health Authority is to be a health and wellness partner for our First Nations people to help them be the best they can be every day of their lives. And it's also important that we recognize that our people own our own health and wellness journeys. And that's an important piece for us today as we move beyond the history of colonization to a place where self-determination will be prevalent in how we approach our daily lives. What I wanted to do in, in, in talking about this work was to share a bit of a story. And the story, uh, Makara's story actually comes from uh, a story from my family and, and something that had happened uh, that really became, I guess, an example of the kind of change that is possible through this kind of relationship we have with BC and Canada. Now, Makara um, it, it was my niece. Um, my brother and, and his wife um, unfortunately lost her at a young age. And, and back in, so back in 2012, um, we lost Makara. She was just almost eight weeks old. And um, with that um, tragic loss, um, you know, not, not only is it difficult whenever you lose a loved one, but an infant baby at that age, it's very, very difficult to deal with the kind of grief and loss that goes on around it. So I think that um, um, what, we, what we realized um, in this was that um, First Nations people, we, as First Nations people, we have customs and traditions around how we take care of our loved ones. And whenever you lose an infant, you end up in a situation where the 
the coroner comes in and um, takes the infant away and does the work that it needs to do. Uh, the first part of the work is around confirming that there are no uh, criminal uh, investigation issues that need to be addressed. And, um, and what we found was that the coroner's service uh, did that initial piece of autopsy and found that, that there were no criminal reasons for pursuing an investigation any further, but talked about um, their need to retain parts of Makara for further investigation. And in our community, what we do is we identify a family spokesperson, and at the end of it, I ended up being the family spokesperson as the work I was doing in First Nations Health situated me in well to ask questions on behalf of my brother and my family and in support of the death protocols of the Islam and people and the work that we needed to do with Makara in support of sending her to the spirit world as well as taking care of my brother and his family. And, and so we, we ended up in a very difficult conversation around trying to explain to the coroner they couldn't do to us any longer things that we didn't want them to do after we had gotten to the point of, of um, clearing any criminal investigation issues and matters. And that at that point in time, that decision actually belonged to our family as to what we wanted to do with Makara. And so we worked through that issue and, and leveraged our partnership with the provincial government and, and, the, and talked to the, the coroner service right up to the chief coroner level around trying to confirm our interests and needs. And eventually we were able to have them acknowledge that they could take an exception for us and that they would release Makara's body intact so that we could do the business that we needed to do. And, and we, we had many situations come up around that in relation to trying to understand why the system was doing what it was doing and how that carried itself out. We had a discussion with the coroner service after the fact because we were, once we were able to, to receive uh, Makara back home, and do our work, we, we made a commitment to follow up with the coroner service and understand the issues that were really at play. And it was interesting to, to uncover that the coroner service had been carrying out this practice with infant babies for a long time. And in fact, actual fact, they couldn't explain to us what the value was of actually carrying out that practice. They couldn't demonstrate that they actually found a cause of death from that extended investigation. And so we, we, we grappled with that notion in relation to what's important to us as First Nations people as from our family's point of view, from our nation's point of view, and that our laws and traditions really do matter, and that what the coroner service was doing was not, not helpful. In fact, it was very important that the coroner service from that point understood that they were actually causing harm for no real reason, that they were actually doing something that made no sense at all in terms of what was happening to the families on the ground. And, and we found that it was interesting that um, reviewing the legislation that the coroners had the authority to call for the autopsy. And in essence, um, then leveraged the, um, the services of pathologists to, to implement the autopsy function. And what we found out from that is that once the coroner was willing to change its approach and recognize that they were causing harm, they were willing to call off the autopsy, but it was the pathologists who continue today to argue the point that, that they have a right or an obligation to continue with an investigation in that manner, which is totally um, tramples on First Nations laws and traditions. And, and so the coroner service has, has done a great bit of work on changing its approach. And, and in today's um, environment, um, we, we're in a different place. We actually um, invited the chief coroner to attend about a year or two after the situation happened, our provincial health forum gathering wisdom for a shared journey. And the chief coroner was very good in coming forward and sharing uh, what had happened in this situation and, and where things were gonna go, what they're looking to do into the future. And, and it was a very, very powerful discussion that we had at that forum. It was, it was, um, it, it was a, it was a moment where we, where we unveiled a lot of hidden issues in relation to how often this had happened to First Nations people in this province. And, and I think um, what we realized too, though, is that it was something that impacted all British Columbians because the practice was being carried out for, for any family that ran into this, this situation. So we had um, the opportunity to continue working with the coroner service 
and the coroner's service uh, now represents, uh, from my point of view, as one of the best health partnerships that we have in British Columbia. The coroner's service has agreed to change the practice and they've actually found um, a pathologist that will work with them that is willing to uh, respect the authority of the coroner's service and call off the autopsy when the coroner's service decides that it's no longer needed. And the coroner's service is very purposely now, once we get to that initial um, initial findings in the autopsy and there are no more criminal charges uh, investigations pending, that they're now willing to put the decision in the hands of the families. And so I think that, um, just got to find out what happened here. I've lost my picture, so whoops. Um, so I've lost my slides. Is this it? There we go. Coming back? Yeah, here we are. Sorry about that. Go ahead, y'all. Just advance them. Apologies for the inconvenience. So what we've um, been able to achieve moving forward is in the last year and a half to two years, um, the, we continue to meet with the coroner's service and, and this, this relationship that we have with them has had a tremendous impact on the quality of service that they provide to First Nations families and in fact to all British Columbians. Because what we found out at the last um, session we had with them, that since they've incorporated changes, there have been 58 infant autopsies carried out in British Columbia and, and 54 times they did not retain the, the, um, the brainstem to do further investigation. So um, only four times did families make that decision for themselves that they wanted to retain the brainstem. And I think that's incredible to consider that 54 families didn't have to go through what my family went through. And more interesting is that about a third of those families were First Nations, so two thirds of those families that benefited from this change are actually uh, other British Columbians. And I think that shows the value of some of the work that we're doing that from a First Nations health partnership, health governance point of view, that, that, that we are actually able to um, make changes in the system that are, are benefiting all British Columbians. A couple other areas in terms of the work with the coroner service that's been really important is that their commitment now to understand First Nations communities, our cultures, and our networks. And they've actually now brought on two First Nations coroners for the first time and continue to work to increase the number of First Nations coroners that they have within their service. So part of our partnership with them, we're looking to enhance the number that are actually attending um, or participating as First Nations coroners. So that's pretty exciting. And, and what we see as we attend their training sessions is that they now have internal capacity to ensure that they provide culturally safe services to coroners um, across the province. The other piece to this is that um, we're now enhancing regional relationships. So the First Nations health governance structure that we put in place is organized through a regional alignment to the regional health authorities in British Columbia. And for the first time ever, we have partnerships with regional health authorities and First Nations communities, but previously it wasn't clear whether the provincial health authorities would provide a consistent and standard quality of care to First Nations communities. So we've organized ourselves to have those conversations and we're, lever we're leveraging that infrastructure for the provincial coroner's service to reach out and form new relationships with BC First Nations communities in a constructive and proactive manner. The best time to build these relationships is before we have crisis in our communities. And so coroners are now working with us to, to meet and, and work and understand our communities in a positive environment. And it's really interesting when we talk about the coroner's service to the First Nations Health Authority and to BC First Nations people, they're really truly trying to become a health and wellness partner to BC First Nations people all across the province. And I think that's um, a really sort of a strong statement in relation to the fact that the coroner service itself is, is finding a new way forward. And I, and I talk about them as being one of our, our major health partnerships. And it's what's really interesting about that is that the BC Coroner Service isn't even connected to the health system within the provincial infrastructure, actually aligned to uh, um, the Ministry of, I think, the Attorney General. And so it's, it's quite interesting that our health and wellness perspective is holistic and takes us far beyond just the health system itself to address those issues that matter to BC First Nations people from a health and wellness point of view. Uh, this statement here from the Regional Coroner of Vancouver Island 
is really uh, indicative of the change that's happened and the willingness of the coroner service to stop and think about their decisions before they make them and put the, the interests of families in the right perspective based on the issues that we're dealing with. I think that to us is an important piece of this work, that a system that previously thought they knew best now is understanding that maybe they don't and maybe that First Nations people, communities, families and nations have the answers for some of these things themselves to move things forward in a better way. So today we're here to talk about cultural humility, cultural safety and humility. And this statement that we have here on the slide was taken from a book uh, written by Rupert Ross and um, about, and the book um, that he put together was around his journey across Northern Ontario looking to try and understand why First Nations people were overrepresented in the correction system. And it's a very fitting statement that he found written on a chalkboard in one of the band halls that he visited in Northern Ontario. And as you can see what it says, I believe you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize what you heard is not what I meant. And I think that's a really important piece for us when we talk about cultural safety and humility and try and unravel what does that really mean moving forward. I think the other context to that is that in this time that we have, moving to a place of reconciliation, it's important that people really understand that reconciliation has to be about us working together to get better. And it's not just about First Nations people getting over residential school, it's about society as a whole finding a better way forward and that First Nations people, um, their interests, their rights, their perspectives, their culture, their language are validated as legitimate within the society. And that with that, we start with a different place and reset the balance of power from where it was, where it was totally imbalanced from an Indigenous perspective to one that is, is equal. So we talk about cultural humility as a lifelong process of self-reflection, self-critique, to understand personal biases, develop and maintain mutual respect for partnerships based on mutual trust. I think that, um, you know, what I would add to this is recognizing that from a cultural humility point of view, Whenever a health practitioner has an opportunity to meet a First Nations person, they have the opportunity to change the narrative that's existed within society for the last 150 years. And from that, it's about not stereotyping. It's trying to understand, to really help a person on their health and wellness journey, you should really understand the history of that person, their family, their nation, and the impact that colonization has had on them. And to look at culture as something that we talk about um, that from a First Nations point of view, our nations will have cultural teachings and knowledge, but the expression of that culture can be done at a personal level, that you have to have an understanding of where that person is at and how they're expressing themselves from a cultural perspective to know how, how to best support and help them on their health and wellness journey. The work that we've been doing in British Columbia through our health partnership um, has been incredible. We've created an opportunity in BC to have a table where we sit with both federal and provincial counterparts, um, a senior governance table that looks at um, a health partnership where we talk about the spirit of reciprocal accountability, that we're collectively accountable to one another for the work that we need to do to improve the health outcomes of First Nations people. And through that reciprocal accountability framework that we've implemented at what we call the Tripartite Committee on First Nations Health, uh, that's our highest governance level committee as part for our health governance structure. And at that table sits the Deputy Minister of Health, the CEOs of all the regional health authorities and the provincial health authority in British Columbia, alongside the First Nations Health Council regional representation and, and ourselves at the First Nations Health Authority. The table is co-chaired by the Deputy Minister from the province, the senior ADM responsible for First Nations Indian Health from Canada, and the chair of the board of directors of the First Nations Health Authority. The meeting is also attended by the provincial health officer and the chief medical officer from the First Nations Health Authority. And so it represents a senior executive table responsible for ensuring that we move forward on our objectives and our goals that we set for ourselves in our health plans, and we do it in the spirit of reciprocal accountability. As we grapple with what reciprocal accountability means, we put forward an agenda on cultural safety and humility in health services for First Nations people and Aboriginal people in British Columbia. And we have a shared commitment to that now. As you see here, this declaration of commitment signed in July 2015 that's signed by the principals of, of 
of the, um, the senior executive of the Tripartite Committee, the Deputy Minister, and the CEOs of all the health authorities. And it's our shared commitment to one another about, our, about moving ahead and implementing cultural safety and humility in the health services in British Columbia. And so it's been an important piece for us to work towards. We talk about cultural competency as something that we strive for, but we're going to put forward the notion that we'll never ever truly achieve it because no two individuals are alike, no two nations are alike, and that we have a lot to learn moving forward. And so cultural humility, is what we talk about, is the way to get there. And I talked a bit about that in terms of having that lifelong learning and self-reflection approach to ensure that we can look at things in a good way moving ahead to really truly understand the people that we're, we're, we're working with and service, working and providing a health service to. And really from our point of view, from the First Nations Health Authority, be a health and wellness partner to that individual and support them on where they want to go on their health and wellness journey. And so with that in mind, we feel that uh, that approach is the, the key to getting to a space of cultural safety in terms of the services that we provide. So having this kind of um, system-wide um, commitment for the provincial health system is extremely important um, with our commitments in the province of British Columbia. Uh, and now as I sort of started the presentation, talked a bit about um, the inconsistency and, and, and lack of clarity around whether the provincial government was providing services to First Nations people in First Nations communities, which in federal Indian reserves are federal lands. So what we've confirmed in our, is that the province is the major service provider of health in British Columbia and that their services are available for all First Nations people regardless of where they live, in other words, home or away from home, on federal lands or living in urban areas. And, and as part of this work, part of our commitment to one another through this new governance structure is the commitment by the province that, that we're hardwiring First Nations health into the, in the provincial system, into the planning processes, and, and basically hardwiring cultural safety and cultural humility into health services as part of the provincial quality and safety agenda. So this is something that we're working towards in British Columbia to really put an emphasis on it and to be, to be clear as we move forward in developing this framework of how we can measure success and what that looks like and the work across the province done at a regional level with the First Nations communities within their respective geographic administrative areas of the regional health authorities, uh, the traditional territories in which they, they practice and they provide services to, there's an important relationship that happens between those nations and the provincial regional health authority in the work moving forward. So that relationship is now resulting in a lot more clarity on the kinds of things that need to happen at that regional level to ensure that cultural humility is exercised in a way that makes sense to the nations and cultural safety is eventually achieved. What we have here is the First Nations Health Authority's three perspectives of quality. We've, we at the Health Authority, we've been uh, delivering services uh, since um, October 2013. So we're relatively new into that side of it. So over the last three years, we just had our third year anniversary, October the 1st. And we move ahead to now look at the quality agenda that's in front of us. So the quality perspectives that we have, recognizing that quality from a critical point of view is an important piece of the work of the process, that we look at our role at the FNHA in ensuring quality for provincial services. In other words, those services that the province are providing to First Nations people, how do we ensure quality there? How do we work with the provincial system, uh, the health authorities, the, the uh, BC Patient Safety Quality Council and others to try and drive quality from a First Nations lens and point of view? Secondly, we recognize ourselves as a service uh, provider, um, that we need to ensure quality of the services that we provide to First Nations people in this province and that we do the best we can. Um, thirdly, we fund community services. Um, so we inherited from First Nations, um, from, from First Nations Indian Health Branch, um, qual um, uh, their, their programs and service agenda that they provided uh, to, to our First Nations communities in British Columbia, and we have over 200 of them. So through that funding mandated community health organizations, we're looking to ensure we can work with our health directors on the ground to, to deliver quality services in our communities and help ensure the service standard there makes a lot of sense. And so I think it's really interesting as we see the, the work moving ahead, we see to deliver this partners at a provincial level and that we see our health directors partners at every level because they really interface with our community services and our First Nations people both home and away from home as best as they can.
and that we work to ensure that our services are done properly. So we have some unique relationships here, and cultural safety and humility is a big part of this agenda at all three levels. So we've created a vision statement for cultural safety and humility that, that helps us move the work forward in a way to, to, to advance things where we want to try and include all of our partners in it in a conversation. And so we talk about these measures or, or these, these sort of statements um, and try and frame the conversation moving ahead. And really what's important to recognize is that um, we really won't know we've achieved cultural safe services until the voice of the people that we're providing the services to tell us we have, because it's really up to them to confirm that we're doing it in a way that makes sense to them. And I think that's been something that's been really important as we, we've considered our work and our, our place in this work as the First Nations Health Authority that was created for First Nations people by First Nations people. With a lot of the work that we've, um, um, we've started moving forward through the declaration that we signed off with the government of British Columbia and Health at, at a senior level, we, we really moved forward with this notion uh, on Aboriginal Day just recently, uh, June 21st of this year, um, with, a, with a, a strong campaign around cultural safety and humility and the notion that it starts with me, that every service provider can change the narrative um, of a First Nations person or Aboriginal person receiving services from the provincial health system immediately by just implementing an approach of cultural humility. And so we've done a lot of work in partnership with the Quality Council here in British Columbia and our health authority partners to really move this out and create awareness not only within the provincial health system and the health providers within that system, but with our First Nations people and communities. On June 21st, Aboriginal Day, we use that as a day of wellness. And the First Nations Health Authority sponsors wellness events that communities um, define and, and design for themselves to meet their needs in terms of wellness. And, and over the, I guess, the last couple of years now, we've had on average about 20,000 First Nations people participate in those events. And so we've, we've really used that as an opportunity to inform our First Nations people that cultural safety and humility is becoming a reality and there are, there are very strong efforts moving ahead to advance work in these areas. So we can figure out the best way to look to see how we, we move this work forward in partnership with our provincial partners, but also with the recognition from First Nations people that their perspectives on how and experiences of the, on their, around their interactions with the provincial health system really matter, and that poor experience is no longer acceptable, and that we have to move the work forward in a better way to support them on their health and wellness journeys. Because as we know, the, um, the, the quality of the interface between First Nations, Indigenous populations, and the provincial health system are, are not what they need to be. And for us to provide better services is a goal that we've committed to in our health plans moving ahead. So part of the, um, the, the, uh, the work that we've been doing is really a call to action. And we've had, um, as part of our commitment on Aboriginal Day moving forward, um, we've provided an opportunity for working in partnership with the Quality Council for people to make pledges in relation to what they want to do to do their part in terms of cultural safety and humility. And here you see a number of, of staff people from the First Nations Health Authority that has, has um, put forward their, their pledges. And in total, we have about 180 pledges from the First Nations Health Authority of our various staff members that are committing to their work in cultural safety and humility. We're doing a number of other pieces as well in terms of Indigenous cultural safety training and other things that we've been taking and ensuring that it's mandatory for the First Nations Health Authority staff moving ahead. We're also engaging our, our partners in this. Here you see leadership from the Provincial Health Services Authority, their, their CEO and, and a couple of the VPs uh, with their commitments to it. And, and I really have to um, acknowledge Carl Roy from, from PHSA as a CEO executive lead and, and Colleen Hart with the work that they've done with me on the declaration um, of cultural safety and humility that we have signed off by, by the um, senior executive from the province, as well as Lynn Stevenson from the ministry who's provided excellent support in this area as well. So we do this work in partnership and together we can really make a difference. So the opportunity that we have, um, you know, we, we talk about some of the pieces here around the kinds of things that are happening and, and really, you know, look to providers 
to improve the provision of, of safe services, uh, really try and understand the true story of the First Nations people. And it's important, especially in this time of reconciliation in this country, that the opportunity is now that we can move ahead in a way to understand and educate ourselves around the truths, true history of, of colonization and its impact on, on the Indigenous populations in this province and not try to push aside those interests and say, well, that happened a long time ago, we have to get over it. I think that uh, moving ahead in, in a way that we can achieve cultural safety is to really respect those kinds of issues. In fact, the First Nations Health Authority, we just recently announced a commitment to, to trauma-informed care to recognize the history of residential school, and that the trauma that our people have faced at residential school continues today, um, both directly for survivors and passed on through an intergenerational impact. And it's something that we need to understand as we look at mental health and wellness being the number one priority for First Nations people in addressing uh, better health outcomes for our people. We've also talked about the Sinias Indigenous Cultural Safety Training, uh, the online training that, that PHSA is providing, and the commitment that we have to take that training at the FHA and the provincial health system as well. And we think it's a great starting point, and, and we were involved in, in the development of that training in the early days and the early part of this work and continue to work with PHSA through our partnership with them in advancing the work and the interest uh, of ensuring that people can take this training moving forward. Um, and, and really beyond that, you know, we want health care professionals to engage with First Nations people from a place of cultural humility. And so a lot of that can be done depending on how people want to look at their own education and their ability to reflect on themselves and where they're at, their ability to, 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 to avoid biases in moving into any engagement with, with an Indigenous individual and, and looking at trying to create a a balance of power and, and move away from the traditional imbalance that exists from a care provider or patient point of view and trying to understand how that imbalance of power is, is just created because of the impact of colonization when the, when the indigenous person comes into the room, they may not be in a, in a strong place to, to assert what their interests and their needs really are. And if the care provider isn't really, really willing to consider that, it makes it a very difficult situation, which usually is difficult to resolve in an effective way in a very short intervention, usually what happens when you go see a doctor, for example. So call to action. Um, the, there's a lot to think about in terms of the work that's in front of us. I think that um, what I'm very um, appreciative of and what I've heard in talking to folks in the provincial system around this work is that signing of the declaration at the senior level confirms that we have permission to act, that the provincial health system working through our partnership with BC First Nations um, the, the Ministry of Health and the Regional Health Authority, the Provincial Health Authority, and all the staff within those organizations and over 100,000 health workers within this province have permission to act to, to work towards um, implementing cultural humility to achieve culturally safe services. And that we want to look at it both at an individual and systemic point of view. So the call to action for individual health care providers is to take that time to slow down and reflect on yourselves and to look at how you approach your interaction with First Nations patients. And in fact, all your patients at British Columbia is a very multicultural society today. And to look at how you approach that and how do you bring cultural humility to that approach to ensure that you don't create an imbalance of power. And, and in addition to that, would ask people that, um, you know, work with their colleagues of like minds and really work to enhance the awareness of cultural humility and, and, and to, to make it a safe place within the health system that people can talk about these issues and address issues when they come up, when they see um, behaviors that are not safe, uh, that they're able to call people on them and that the system itself works, to, works towards implementing accountability in terms of what that would look like within that, that health organization to ensure cultural safety and humility are realized. And so I really think it's important we use the hashtag, it starts with me, because each and every one of us can change that narrative moving forward today based on what we choose to do. So it really is that opportunity to, to empower ourselves from that very frontline worker level all the way up the system. And I, I see my job as, as a CEO of the Health Authority to not only champion this work, but to work with my colleagues at the Leadership Council table, the CEOs of the other health authorities, 
and the senior executive of the ministry to ensure that we create a safe space and we achieve these outcomes and that we're accountable for these outcomes when we meet together at the tripartite committee of First Nations Health to meet our reciprocal accountabilities to one another in relation to this work. So it's a really an exciting framework I think that we have in British Columbia that we have permission from the top and that drives right down to the ground to, to provide that support to individual healthcare providers to start that journey on cultural safety and humility from their own perspective. And that First Nations communities and people, a lot of us are ready to have that conversation with you and, and I would welcome the invitation to support a dialogue to ensure that we can, we can make improvements to the health system, much like what we talked about with Makara's story and, and, and the, the, the transformation that we see at the BC Coroner Service, a provincial organization that serves the entire province that each and every one of us, you know, in our lives has an opportunity of encountering uh, because at some point we all leave this world and, and they themselves have done a, a, a tremendous transformation to now be a, a health and wellness partner to First Nations people and, and really take cultural safety and humility to heart. So it's been quite exciting to see that and to see that we're actually making inroads now within the provincial health system as well. And we have that example of what it can look like moving ahead and the commitment that they've made to work with First Nations people all across this province. Okay, so I guess now we're passing uh, the, the, uh, the control back to Colleen, so we'll look to do that Wonderful. here. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Joe, for, for that presentation and to everyone for joining us on the call today. We really want to invite you now to share your questions. Um, so people can, we've got two choices. You can pop your questions into the chat box for Joe and we'll share them and, and Joe will respond. We also, because the lines are muted because there's so many people on the call today, we invite you just to um, hold up your hand and there's a hand icon on the right hand side of the screen right below the main participant box. And we can have, um, you asked your questions. Um, we had somebody just have a note in the chat box just now, Joe, saying outstanding. Thank you, Joe. Um, Brian, I raised my hand to Joe and FNHA leadership for your work. Some lovely feedback. Are there any questions from folks on the call today? We really want to hear your voice as well and have an, a, an opportunity for dialogue. All right. Um, one question that's just coming in from Lucy, and it says, this is, she said, thank you so much, Joe, for your presentation. And the question she has for the group is, uh, and for you, Joe, is what would be helpful for health authorities to know when addressing, addressing patient care concerns? So what uh, would sorry, helpful, could you? You bet. What would be helpful for health authorities to know when addressing patient care concerns? Well, I, I think, um, what would be helpful is, is first of all to acknowledge where we're currently at and to acknowledge that, um, you know, the, the interface when we're talking about in, in this situation from a First Nations point of view, um, what's the relationship that that health authority currently has with the population that they serve and how do they look at it? Because the, the current relationship um, isn't resulting in a positive outcome for First Nations people. Um, at times when, when the kinds of services that are be, being provided aren't really hitting the mark in terms of what First Nations people need. So I think it's important that there's that, that learning and developing of a relationship between the health authority and the First Nations population that they serve. There's an opportunity to do that um, in a way where uh, in, in regional health authorities working with First Nations communities can get a very broad perspective of the nations within their respective geographic administrative areas and what that looks like in terms of those functional relationships and what's important to the nations and what they're what they're, um, who they are as, as, as a population. And then use that as, as um, a bit of, a, I guess, a, a backdrop or a framework, if you will, for having individual patient encounters. So you have a bit of an understanding of the nation, but then when you meet the patient, you actually really want to understand where they are at with their culture based on their health and wellness journey. So I think it'd be that kind of approach that would be important for the health authorities to, to consider as they look at, um, continuing to work to provide services and care to First Nations people. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joe. We have another question that's come in from Lita. And her question is, as a frontline provider with little time to establish rapport, 
how do I ask First Nations clients what they hope to achieve in their health and wellness journey? I, I think, you know, with the um, short time frame there, it's, it's almost kind of like the work you do in advance of that. So you, you want to create, again, just as I said, you know, that, that sort of understanding of, of the Indigenous people that are within your service area. And I think that's really helpful because then the, the interaction has a lot more quality so that you're, you're going to be learning within that, that short interaction, but you actually have a body of knowledge to draw on to help you understand what you're hearing moving ahead. Because I think that short time frame is a real challenge. And ideally, uh, what we're looking to do at the First Nations Health Authority is to, for example, implement some service approaches that allow for more of a relationship building piece to it in such a short encounter. But I think if you do have a, only that short brief window, having that information in advance is really helpful and getting to know the Indigenous community or the community around you uh, when you're not in that, not in a crisis situation is usually the best way to, you know, just build those positive relationships. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, I think that's a really good feedback as we navigate this journey is some of those practical, tangible things that people can do in their everyday work. Um, another question, this is from Kathy Woods, and she's asking about how the call to action is going with the five regional health authorities. How has the response been to that call to action um, to date? Well, I think it's been going really well. Um, you know, on Aboriginal Day, for example, this, this past June, I, as I mentioned, each health authority um, leadership and, and others really got involved and different health authorities did different things. So it's good to see the uniqueness and the approaches that they're taking because all our regions are quite different. And that the Tripartite Committee on First Nations Health, we meet twice a year. So at the last meeting, um, about four or five months ago, we had the first opportunity for the regional health authorities to report back at the provincial table. And it was really exciting to hear what they were saying about not only what they're doing, but the impact that it was having within their organizations. And that their teams were feeling that it was a rich experience and they were actually getting better uh, as a team because they were uniting around a common issue like this and something that had this kind of purpose and meaning behind it. So we're having another tripartite committee meeting uh, on October 31st at the end of this month. And I'm quite excited to see and hear from the health authorities again on how that work has progressed over the last few months, as well as start looking to see how we think we're going to measure progress in this area. So we are early days, but the commitment across the province to the health authorities uh, remains strong and we're, we're seeing a lot of pieces move ahead. A lot of folks have taken us up on the pledges and you see that happening in the various health authorities and, and just to see the story growing and people feel enabled has been, been quite exciting for us. Great, Joe. It's amazing to hear the momentum that's coming out of that campaign. We have a question now from Rachel. Rachel, I'm just going to unmute your line so you can ask the question. You should be unmuted now, Rachel. Please go ahead. What's our question? What's our question? Hello? Hi. Please go ahead. We've unmuted your line, Rachel. Can you hear me? Sure can, Rachel. Please go ahead. Our question. How do we measure the progress when all of this sounds really wonderful and awesome from the First Nations Health Authority to create this call of action, yet in the front line, that is not what is occurring. The information does not seem to be filtering down to the partners that we need to create a mutually agreeable service with. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Rachel. Joe, were you able to hear that okay? Yes, yes, I did, thanks. Thank you very much for the question. I think it's, it's really uh, one of the things that I realize um, when I'm sitting at leadership council with the other CEOs, that it's a long way to the front lines. And um, what I've um, been working on with the province and why we talked about um, you know, this work in cultural safety and humility being part of the, the, uh, the quality agenda for the province is so that we can get to measurables. And I think that, um, you know, the, the issues that we're working through as part of the quality agenda is to create a space for the voice of our people to identify where it's not working so we can address, you know, complaints and concerns. And, and you know, in, in some instances, some of our early indicators probably are about use, using a complaints process 
to understand that our people are starting to share their voice and, and raise their concerns and that they're going to be heard and then the ability to follow up in terms of addressing the complaints that have been raised. So I, I think that um, there's a lot of measures that we need to put in place and we're at the beginning of that and that's part of my, my work, uh, as I say, with the upcoming tripartite committee when we hear about what the, um, um, what the health authorities are doing is, is just that same issue. How do we measure it in terms of progress at the front lines and on the ground and try and see how far it's gone but at the same time, enhance our work with partners to confirm how First Nations issues can be raised. So we at the FNHA receive complaints from our First Nations people and communities, and we're building a pathway to have those complaints addressed. And we know that health authorities and other provincial agencies also have processes to raise concerns, and we want to make sure they work for First Nations people. And, and that in itself will start giving us some metrics to understand, and sometimes we need to hear, hear the, the concerns first so that we know what the range of them are and then start measuring progress to address them. Thank you so much, Joe. Is there anything you wanted to ask in response, Rachel? Your line is unmuted, Rachel. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think um, we look forward to seeing what that whole process is going to be. Uh, we definitely have some issues with uh, frontline workers in the province. Great, thank you so much. Um, just one last question, Joe, maybe before we wrap up today. Um, we had a question from Jer uh, Jerry, and he said, how can we balance a desire to learn history and context from folks without reinvoking trauma? Yeah, it's, um, it's a good question, and I think that, um, uh, you know, when, when depending on where you're, where you're at and, and when you look to see about building that relationship with First Nations in your area or individuals, um, it, it's a delicate piece, and I think that there is, you know, a lot to be said around, um, first of all, the importance of trauma-informed care and the training around that. Uh, so that you understand what is happening. And then I think beyond that, um, you know, as you approach community and First Nations people, um, there, there will be those that, that will be willing to share that are in a good place to do that and others that, that may not be. Um, so it's about, you know, finding some of those pieces. And, and that's part of, I think, the work that all of us can do around trying to find the pathway forward because I think if we, and which is why, you know, at the FHA we've committed to the trauma-informed care piece, so that we do it as best as we can too, and try and understand how we can best move ahead to not only have the conversations with, with our First Nations people, but be very mindful of, 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 of that whole notion of triggering something. I think that's an important piece and a consideration, and I, I think there are, there are ways of doing it and, and people to, to talk through about that. And I think part of it for us is um, how we work with, for example, the education system to bring that history into it um, in a safe way, uh, whether it's um, K to 12 or it's post-secondary. So there's lots of other ways too, but there are, you know, a lot of our organizations that are willing and ready to have that conversation and that they're prepared to have the full dialogue, you know, with, with folks and organizations and institutions around that. And, and I think there's a number of other ways that could happen as well if we look into it. Thank you very much for sharing, Joe. There's an abundance of feedback happening in the chat box here, and I think we could probably go on for a couple hours with questions. So um, perhaps I'll just do this very last question. Um, um, so wondering if and how lateral kindness can be linked to assess the progress in cultural humility and cultural safety. Um, so this is more of a comment just to give feedback on, on your previous point. Um, the other point that was raised was around uh, patient experience being really important in this process, and so that was another really important point. And I don't wanted to know if there's anything you wanted to add to that comment about what we can do to engage patients in those changes. Yeah, I, um, the lateral kindness piece I think is, is really important um, for us to, to build into our, our approaches around cultural safety and humility. I mean, I think it fits perfectly because of, you know, that notion of, of creating a, a respectful relationship 
a balance of power and, and a, a real true validity of the voice of, of the patient. So the patient experience ultimately for us, as I've said in our vision statement, is we'll know we've achieved cultural safety when the people we're providing support to and services to tell us we have. So we've got to create that pathway. We've got to create that understanding of, of having that feedback, um, whether it's instantaneous or it's something different, but there's the opportunity to ensure that we get that feedback and we're always open to the, to the comments and, and the input that we get to try and always strive to be better. Thank you, Joe. Um, I just, I hate to turn this last question down that's come in from a student. She just wanted to ask one last question and I promise we'll wrap it up. And how do you see the reconciliation process relating to this movement? Well, I think the reconciliation process um, has been a long time coming, as everyone knows. It's taken a long time for the government of Canada not only to move forward on the TRC recommendations, which have been coming through and discussions around it, but um, the UN Declaration of Indigenous Rights as well, which really kind of sets an overarching framework for some of this. But I think what happens now with the government of Canada um, acknowledging the importance of reconciliation, and it's important for folks to know whether they do or not, that um, the health leaders across this country this past summer um, uh, confirmed that Indigenous health is the number one priority for the health system in this country. And the lens that they look at that through is the truth and reconciliation recommendations. So I think that um, what we, where we are is in a great space right now uh, where there is commitment at the highest levels of government in this country to, to understand and implement reconciliation. And the approaches that they're talking about are really focused on ensuring that First Nations are fully engaged and speaking for themselves in this process, which I think is really important. And I, I look to some of the work we're doing in British Columbia at, uh, through our health governance structure and the First Nations decision-making framework we put in place as an opportunity to express the voice of our people from the individual family, community, and nation levels and provincially as we move this work forward. So I think it's really well, well, well reconciliation is an approach that can be seen as uh, a way of, as we've shown with the partners' service work, that we're, we can be better together and do things in a better way that benefit all of us. Wonderful, Joe. I'm just conscious of the time now and just thank you so much for your comments, for taking the time to offer questions. And I just wanted to know if you had any final closing statement before we wrap up. Uh, really just honored to have the opportunity to speak to everyone and um, to share the teachings and learnings that we have from our First Nations people across the um, uh, that we have received from across the province and, and look forward to seeing the future seminar, uh, webinars as they come up. Thank you very much for having me today. Joe, it's truly our honor to have you join us. Thank you so much for taking the time to present. Um, we're really thrilled to have you as we launch the webinar series. Just uh, an announcement regarding our next webinar. It will be on November 2nd, 2016 at the same time, noon until 1 o'clock. And we're really thrilled that um, we will be looking at reconciliation as it relates to health and wellness. So very related to that last question that came in. Um, and Shelley Joseph will be joining us for that session. So thanks again, Joe, and to everyone who took the time to join us today. We look forward to seeing you next time.